So, Anna doesn't think that I can cover all of visual fields in 10 minutes. Yeah. Do you want her to cover visual fields? No. Okay, so just sort of to uh, review, I'm going to just uh, hit some of the highlights of how to do visual fields, uh, how to document visual fields, and then the anatomy of visual fields. Well, that's going to be very brief because most of that's going to be covered in the cases. So, um, you know, the, con the concept of the, uh, the island of vision in the sea of darkness, um, where uh, um, the, uh, s the steepness of the slope um, of what you're able to see kind of increases uh, rapidly the further out you get to the point where you can't see anything at all. It is normal not to be able to see behind your head except if you're a mom. Um, this is the most uh, basic way of documenting visual fields. It's what you're taught and do every single day. Um, you're uh, fixating your eye and the patient's eye and presenting targets in all four quadrants of the visual field, not out here. This is extremely insensitive to the semaphore of view. When we're teaching the medical students next month, um, that's the habit that must be um, extinguished. Uh, I just do one or two fingers. Uh, some people do one, two, or five. You have to make sure that the uh, stimuli are presented straight on rather than kind of on an angle. Uh, this is a, um, the bowl that is used for um, automated perimetry, uh, also for uh, uh, kinetic perimetry. The difference being that with kinetic perimetry, the targets of varying sizes are brought in from the edge, from the non-seeing to the seeing, and the patient indicates uh, the first point that they see them. The smaller the target, the closer towards the center they see them. And when you join up those um, uh, lines of where they do see them, it makes an isopter, and uh, this is sort of a demonstration of the kinetic versus the static perimetry. Uh, here is, of course, the physiologic blind spot. It's an absolute scotoma. There's no retina there, therefore there's no vis vision. Um, the other uh, uh, um, format that we use uh, quite frequently is the tangent screen. Um, so easy to use, uh, so very useful. Um, it can be used for non-physiologic vision loss for children uh, and for people with very bad vision. It can also be used uh, for uh, extremely sensitive testing of the central vision for uh, uh, drug toxicity. Uh, some people use a central red target. Um, you uh, document the visual fields um, by uh, presence or absence of finger counting or hand motion or light perception in the four different quadrants. Uh, the right on the right eye and right, right eye on the right side, left eye on the left side. The only um, thing in medicine that is documented this way, backwards. Okay, so just to sort of cover the field of the, the um, anatomy of the vision, um, I love this picture just because it's like antique. Uh, but basically, the concept is the uh, right side of the brain deals with the left half of the vision, and uh, you can see here how. The left field of vision goes to the right part of the retina of both eyes and gets transmitted here over to the left side of the brain um, through those uh, radiations and the tracts. Um, the anatomy is um, um, uh, dependent on, sorry, the visual field is dependent on the anatomy and it's one of the nice uh, uh, anatomic correlations that we have in medicine. It's one of the reasons I think why neuro-ophthalmologists are such happy people. So um, this is the field of it. This is the uh, physiologic blind spot where the optic nerve is coming into the back of the eye, and then the uh, fibers radiate in these uh, patterns. Uh, the um, retina is, is this is a demonstration here of an area of damaged retina just above the horizontal raphe, which is going to lead to a scotoma down below. I actually like to use the physiologic blind spot as a reference spot. So. If the patient is saying that the defect is towards their nose, then I'm going to be looking in the retina in a corresponding location compared to the physiologic blind spot. Um, this is just another graphic representation, and I'm, gonna, I'm including this because uh, it also talks about the pupillary fibers, uh, specifically talking about the optic tracts um, and the uh, fibers that uh, deke off the tract in the superior colliculus, the breaking of the superior colliculus. Uh, um, taking care of the pupillary responses, which becomes very important in an optic tract lesion uh, characterized by an incongruous, meaning uh, different in the two eyes, uh, visual field defect, 
often with a relative afferent pupillary defect, which is small, um, there can be damage to the nearby structures, uh, which would include um, the, the temporal lobe, uh, the thalamus is just right above here, and um, uh, you can get uh, uh, associated damage uh, with the cortical spinal tracts as well. Uh, you can, because of this, get a pupillary defect without a visual field defect. It's pretty rare. Um, the uh, relative afferent pupillary defect occurs in the eye contralateral, contralateral to the affected tract because of the different percentage of fibers that are, that are crossing in the chiasm. And uh, the, uh, that's, a, that's the correct way of um, considering it. I personally uh, sort of think of it a little bit more in a mechanistic way. So if you have a left hemianopia, um, you have a, a bigger left visual field than you have right visual field. And therefore, there are going to be more pupillary fibers represented in that bigger visual field. And therefore, the defect will be in your left uh, relative after pupillary defect from a left visual field defect from the right tract. Uh, and this is just a nice little example here stolen from Stanford of a tract lesion. The uh, chiasm is just right here, and then the tracts are going here to the uh, lateral genicula. Um, this is uh, meant to explain why you get um, bow tie atrophy, but we're not going to talk about that. Um, we're going to talk a little bit about the lateral geniculate, which is an extremely small structure right here, shaped like a Napoleon hat. Um, and you can see how close it is also to the thalamus and the descending cortical spinal tracts. Uh, the lateral geniculate lesions are extremely rare, but much discussed because they're so cool. Um, lateral geniculate lesions come in two varieties, um, uh, anterior, posterior, and I don't know if you're going to be talking about those more, but um, this is a representation of a classic uh, uh, anterior lesion and this is a posterior lesion. Um, I personally think that you need to just memorize how these look because it's just too hard to go through the math every single time to work it out. But um, you can have your own way of remembering this. I'm thinking of this sort of looking at it anatomically as more of an anterior kind of a thing, and that is a little bit more of a posterior kind of a thing, but you know, knock yourselves out. You can figure out a way to memorize it yourselves. Uh, uh, Retrogeniculate loss can occur from a variety of uh, um, pathologies, including strokes and masses. Um, I, I don't know that there's necessarily any way of figuring out before imaging what it is that's caused the defect other than by the classic, did it come on slowly or gradually. Um, geniculate lesions are often uh, seen with small strokes and masses, uh, and particularly with thalamotomies, which are um, movement disorder uh, surgeries. Uh, the temporal lobe lesions are typically superior visual fields. The parietal, parietal are typically in visual, inferior visual fields. Temporal lobe pathology would include things like hallucinations, uh, seizures, uh, uh, auras, specifically um, rising fear, uh, um, deja vu, jamais vu, those kinds of things. Parietal are often associated with language or uh, association problems. We'll talk a little bit more about that. Occipital lesions are often associated with reading problems, uh, and, but can be almost asymptomatic as well. Um, I don't think I'm going to have time to talk about the macular splitting and sparing. Uh, temporal lobe lesions, um, as I said, can be associated with um, these uh, hemiparetic hallucinations, language problems as well. Um, this is a nice example of a, um, uh, a temporal lobe lesion uh, way up high. Uh, one of the things about the um, anatomy of the visual fields that you can count on, and if you can remember this, it can be very helpful for the, especially the temporal parietal, uh, is that the lower portion of the retina goes to the lower portion of the optic nerve, goes to the lower portion of the chiasm, and goes to tract, lateral geniculate, goes through the temporal lobe, and then goes to the lower portion of the occipital lobe. The, the right and left and the chiasm and all that sort of stuff is happening independently, but below stays below. So all of that, all of those lower things are going to give you an upper visual field effect. 
The parietal lobe, if you remember, is kind of up here. Upper portion of the retina, upper portion of the nerve, upper portion of the chiasm, skipping through the temporal lobe and up through the parietal lobe. It's going to give you lower visual field defects. It goes to the upper portion of the uh, occipital lobes. And so to the extent that that's a, another useful way of trying to remember the anatomy, that can be helpful. Um, parietal lobe lesions can be associated with some really interesting uh, neurologic syndromes, uh, language problems, hemisensory defects in the dominant hemisphere, and um, Gerstmann syndrome of agraphia, acalculia, finger agnosia, and left-right disorientation, which is extremely hard to document, especially if you have finger agnosia, because if you're asking which finger it is, and they can't even name their finger, then how do you know? <laughs> Kathleen and I have like had a little uh, thought experiment about that one. Mm. The parietal lobe, the non-dominant parietal lobe, uh, is associated with spatial disorientation, constructional apraxia, dressing apraxia, shaving apraxia, uh, and anosognosia, unawareness of the defect. And I just wanted to show you a nice parietal lesion. You can see that it's down below uh, fixation. It is incongruous, but it's not exactly the same in both eyes, so we're not all the way back to the occipital lobes. And then this is my favorite uh, picture of a letter that um, a neighbor wrote to my mom, which I think you've probably all seen at this point, which is, Dear Ray, how are things going? Things are really great, blah, blah, blah. Had a little stroke. Uh, they're not letting me drive. I don't know why. <laughs> I look forward to seeing you again soon. <laughs> so obviously, this is demonstrating left-sided neglect. But she's no language problems, right? She's writing away like a champ and she is not really aware of exactly what happened. Um, and uh, just to touch on the occipital projections, of course this is, remember, the, uh, as I was saying, the uh, inferior uh, rim of the uh, calcarine cortex here is from the inferior, inferior, inferior. So you now projecting to the superior portion of the nerve. The central fibers are more posterior, and there's this little rim of uh, very, very temporal fibers that take care of the temporal crescent, which looks like that. So this is a nice example of uh, the left eye visual field, the right eye visual field, and then the both eyes together visual field, where somebody has a hemianopia with sparing of the temporal crescent. This is a really nice example. And the, sorry, the lesion was right there in the occipital, where was the lesion? That was occipital, okay. yeah. And so would that be more um, anterior or more posterior, more of the front end of the occipital lobe or in the back end of the occipital lobe? The back end. So the center fibers are uh, involved and the very, very anterior end of the occipital lobe is spared because that temporal crescent is still there. So the posterior pole is more affected than the um, front end of the occipital lobe. So there wouldn't be a crescent. Yeah, if the whole occipital lobe gets out, then you get out your temporal crescent. You lose your temporal crescent. Not demonstrated on um, uh, Humphrey visual field testing. Okay. Ha. It's pretty good. Is it not demonstrated on Humphrey just because it doesn't, doesn't go, go out far enough? Because you can see it's way the heck out there. That's like at 60 to 80 degrees. Mm -hmm. But the patients may say, well, I think I can see something out here. And you try and like get a stimulus into there, and it's, it's hard because it's way the heck out there. And they can't really read with it or anything. I don't know if you need this. Do you need this for, you know, that was something from him. OK. There we go. All right, so now it's all cases all the time. There is a quiz is going to be interspersed, right? Well, it's, um, yes. Uh, <laughs> so I got a little carried away, as I always do. So, like, 10 cases and I was like, mm, that's a, little, oh, a lot of cases. So I kind so of put a quiz 45 in 45 minutes. I know. Well, we're going to work through it. And as you know, I, I like things to be a little interactive. So we're going to keep it a little interactive, keeping in mind the entire time limitations. But with visual fields especially, I feel like you have to really talk through it and um, I think even the most experienced of us have to sometimes, um, I think, think de deeply when we look at visual field deficits because, you know, of all upside down, right, left uh, um, anatomy. Um, so 
Um, we're going to start uh, with this visual field. And um, so I'm going to get one of you guys, and maybe let's um, start with one of the junior residents um, describing this visual field. And then we'll talk about what this is and why this is happening. So Tara, do you want to start? Yeah, so there's like some scattered scotomas, almost like in the same location, like. So why don't you start office. with yeah. like, like, remember how you were taught to read an x-ray? Yeah. So this is a chest x-ray okay. of the right person, maybe you don't know, and what eye, you know, so what kind of visual field is this? Okay, so this is a Humphrey visual field. And what kind of Humphrey visual field? Um, a central 10. Well, or, see that little 30 there on the oh, right? 30. 30 yeah. 30 so two. You have one, two, and three. And this is 30, so it gives you 30 from fixation. And which eye is this? I think this is the right eye. It is the right eye. And why don't you think this is a blind spot? Um, why do you think it's a physiological blind spot? Physiological blind because it's only located superior to the meridian? Well, no, but I mean, yeah. sure, but it's the, that, that's true. But sometimes, um, because of the indices of the test, you might not get some points there. But what you're, you're seeing here is the fact that it's kind of within seven degrees or so of the fixation. And where you see here, it's kind mm -hmm. of within the 12 and a half that we normally um, have between the blind spot, the ph physiologic blind spot, and the fixation. Am I supposed to put Paris here? Go on, here. All right. So and okay. So it's a Humphrey 30 dash whatever. You won't know this, but it's a 30 dash two visual field of the right eye. And as you mentioned, what kind of describe what you're seeing? Um, so there is. It looks like an enlargement of the physiologic blind spot. And then there is a scotoma uh, that looks like it could be near fixation, and then four other scotomas uh, kind of in the mid periphery of the all. Of the yeah, so I mean, the gist is that you have these depressed quadrantic visual field deficits. Kind of in each quadrant, you have that, right? Mm -hmm. um, so does anybody recognize kind of pattern recognition what this field is? So let's start with categories. Is it brain, nerve, this looks retina, or retinal, or no, it's retinal? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So to understand this visual field, you really have to understand how Humphrey visual field algorithm works. And I understand that you guys have regular lectures in rotation, kind of describing the algorithms and how to um, read visual fields. Um, but um, what Humphrey visual field algor algorithm does, it usually um, checks the quadrants first and kind of more central quadrants just to, um, to see what the um, kind of the um, uh, kind of general uh, threshold is in that uh, quadrant. And so if the patient falls asleep at the beginning of the test or doesn't recognize the test has started, they actually miss those areas that the Humphrey visual field algorithm checks. And so you get this visual field where you have these isolated quadrantic defects. Now, this can be, of course, retinal lesions, but you have to look at the retina to make sure that they correspond to these particular lesions. Does that make sense? All right. So, Lee, do you want to take this one on? So this is a gentleman we saw a few weeks ago. Um, he's got thyroid eye disease and he's had multiple surgeries and he does his visual field and this is what it looks like. So again, is he start to the patient. Uh, yeah, that sounds good enough. <laughs> so this is a Humphrey visual field 30-2. Oh. Um, and Sorry, I'm going to take it back. Is it 30 2? Or maybe 30 1. No. <laughs> 24, yeah, I'm sorry. You. <laughs> yeah, and why is that? Because, because you have the, the 30 there, yeah, it doesn't exactly. quite go. So, question <laughs> for you is what 
amount um, in degrees of visual field is a Humphrey 24-2 tested. And I'm giving a hint, horizontal and vertical. Um, horizontal, I guess it's 24 degrees. Okay, so this is 10, this is 10, this is 10. Maybe it's too early to do math this morning, but. Well, it's this 24 on the other side. Right? Sorry? Yes. So, yes. So 24 and then 30. Mm -hmm. So it's a combination of those. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> it is turned to teaching math. <laughs> All right. And so in this, in this, in the horizontal versus the vertical, right, you get 30 plus 24, 54, 54 degrees. And the, do you know the reason why we get 30 degrees in the nasal quadrant? Um, so Humphrey Visual Field was designed to, to check for glaucoma, okay? So by design, the test is um, to check for visual field deficits associated with glaucoma. And what is the earliest visual field deficit commonly associated with glaucoma? It is a nasal step. So this is why you have you know, 30 degrees here, and that's why they kept it when a 24-2 algorithm was designed versus a 30-2, which is an older algorithm, in order to speed up the test, reduce the amount of visual field, but increase uh, or still keep your sensitivity up for a glaucoma to visual field deficit. So hence you have the 30 degrees nasally um, that is kept in the Humphrey visual field, which is 24-2. All right, so the pattern recognition of this visual field is? What does that mean? If the patient wasn't attentive during the testing. When during the testing? Um, I think later on. Correct. So this is, a again, a, an important aspect of interpreting visual fields is understanding how the visual fields are performed and uh, how they're tested. So like we've, if we use the information that we got from the previous case, we know that these central quadrants are tested first. And so when the patient is paying attention, they've got their central quadrants in each eye, but then um, they kind of fall asleep or you know, they're tired or they're malingering, and then they kind of give up and stop pressing the button. And so you have this pattern of a relief visual field test, and it doesn't always indicate the patient is malingering, but it can also indicate somebody who is tired and just falls asleep at the uh, end of the case or at the end of the test. All right, Nika, I want to take this one. Sure. Um, so this is a visual field defect. I'm not sure what it is, maybe a 24-2. Mm -hmm. um, of the Not sure. Well, I'm not sure which eye as well. Uh, so this is the pattern deviation um, you know, of the maybe the left and right eyes, which shows mm -hmm. a yeah, kind yeah. of a central a scotoma. Mm -hmm. Okay. So this patient is a 79-year-old man who um, came into our clinic a few weeks ago and he complained with, uh, of difficulties driving and his wife thought he kind of drove off the road a little bit before she warned him. And on two separate occasions, these visual fields were re reproduced. So this is, this is a reliable visual field. And um, what is really important to note about this field is, is kind of symmetric, okay? And what I'll, we'll, what I'll talk about throughout this lecture is about um, how uh, we're looking at the um, flavor of a visual field, right? So it doesn't always have to be perfect because of the imperfections of our field testing, but um, the important thing is, is when you look back at the fields, you have to think about the kind of the, the pattern and the flavor of a visual, visual field rather than just, well, it doesn't quite fit, right? So we're gonna see a few cases later on that show us that. But this is um, a basically, as you can see, almost like a ring scotoma, right? So it doesn't quite form a ring, but almost there. So that's what I mean by the flavor. So, um, you know, if the, the vision I put he, for you here on purpose because it is not a central visual field, okay? It's a paracentral kind of ring scotoma. And, you know, the definitions about central, paracentral versus mid peripheral ring scotomas um, kind of are beyond uh, our discussion here, but 
it's important to understand what things can cause it because there's a lot of visual field deficits that can present that way and it's relative to the anatomy that Dr. Warner had discussed earlier. So um, what I want you to think about and tell me are what clinical tests would you be able to do to confirm that this is a maculopathy versus an optic neuropathy. So we talked about this in the visual approach to visual fields, or approach to vision loss a few weeks ago. Just uh, a few tests that you guys can think about and show them out. Focus stress tests. Sorry, yeah, very good. Let's see. Oh. Multifocal. Multifocal, yeah. I mean, that's great. And of course, we talked a little bit about color vision, but you have to think about how you're going to differentiate in this patient between maculopathy and optic neuropathy. And of course, part of it is your clinical exam. This patient was sent by an ophthalmologist. He had a full dilated exam, and this was sent as an unexplained vision loss of this particular pattern. So I don't have a color photo for you because it's not impressive, and we actually didn't take it, but um, I will show you this. Okay. And uh, what this patient has is large areas of geographic atrophy. And as you can see on the, um, on the um, OCT, you, um, you have outer retinal um, atrophy, which is consistent with GA. But on clinical exam, it was difficult to see because there was not a lot of pigmentation, there was not a lot of drusen, it was just atrophy, and maybe if you're not looking carefully enough, you're just not seeing it well. So again, the clinical exam is important, but this was an ophthalmology referral, and it's easily missed, these kind of things, just because they might not always look as you expect them to look. I just want to point out again, this is talking about uh, using the, the physiologic blind spot as an anatomic reference point. So you know that uh, you can't really see it very well because it's an absence, but uh, Anastasia, why don't you point out that's where the physiologic blind spot is on that visual field, and the same thing on the other side. And so you could say, okay, well, the physiologic blind spot's here, and then the fovea is here, and then on the other side, you've got about that same amount of space, so you know that the pathology that is being demonstrated by this visual field is between the physiologic blind spot and about the same distance away from the macula. So, you know, if you kind of look at that, that's where this, that's a, that's where this central 10 degrees of the 24-2 is, is representing, is this kind of center area within the arcades. And you know, you know, again, the other thing to point out is, you know, you, you can look at this um, physiological blind spot and see, well, is this a secocentral scotoma? But as you can see, the vis visual acuity was quite good. And of course, you have the corresponding pathology to see on the fungus presentation. They didn't do a OCT? No, because they didn't see anything on the macula and thought the macula looked good. It's really dramatic here, but on the real life, Okay. Yeah, again, this, this is because of the imaging we used, right? The yeah. color photos, you actually wouldn't see much. You, you might see a little bit of a color difference in the retina just because of the RP atrophy. But, um, you know, if, if, if you're just doing a slit lamp exam and you have a quick look and you might not notice it. Say if you had a occipital level lesion, and, or say you had a visual field that had uh, a congruous, congruous um, central scotoma. Um, and you were trying to decide whether or not this is maybe, say, a, a retinal lesion versus an occipital lesion. Would you get such, uh, would you have any kind of visual acuity um, changes that would kind of hint you as to maybe this is more of an occipital versus? Well, you know, no, I mean, you have to think about where that uh, your um, uh, center of your visual field is and what fibers correspond to that. So you'd have to have like bilateral occipital lesions with only affecting the macula that gives you this, which is... can happen. So can happen, the, the answer is, uh, with a unilateral occipital lobe lesion, there shouldn't be any acuity loss, but with bilateral occipital lesions, you can be anywhere from 20-20 to blind. And, uh, but looking at those visual fields, that, that's definitely a good thought. You just want to look at each one of those, maybe the black one, the greater than 0.05% chance that this is abnormal, right? The, the ones that are surely abnormal. And you look at each one, and these are not congruous. So mm -hmm. one of the things you want with it being an occipital lesion, which is, a, which is a great thought, you really want those to be a little more congruous. But if you look, it's like it's not congruous, right? It, you, it's almost like the number of spots that are, the, that, are, that are different is way more than the number of spots that are the same. Great. All right. So this is a case of a 24-year-old who came in um, because she had these new headaches and she had some visual auras 
and um, her PCP ordered an MRI, and it was okay, and so she was told to go see an eye doctor. So she comes to see an eye doctor, and um, she comes in with this. <laughs> so um, again, um, let me be Reese, pattern recognition. Uh, so it's 24-2, right. visual field, and then it's, she's got kind of bilateral generalized constriction. Anything else you can call this? Um, Keywords? Uh, Central Island? Yeah, I mean, this is, uh, we call this a ring scotoma, oh. okay? So you just, you got central, so basically it's a scotoma that's centered on the, the visual axis or the visual um, center. And um, I think this is a really, really, really important um, differential diagnosis to understand that I don't think you guys get taught enough. And um, it, it, you know, a ring scotoma, like I said, is, is an annular defect which is centered on fixation and um, it encircles fixation, but visual acuity is preserved, okay? So I, I briefly mentioned that um, you can get central, paracentral, and mid peripheral ring scotomas. It depends on the site of pathology. Um, we saw kind of more of a central ring scotoma in the, the case that I showed previously. Um, the pericentral usually incorporates the blind spot. So this is where you see um, things like uh, glaucoma um, coalescing um, inferior and superior arcuate causing a ring scotoma. Or you can see that, of course, in any type of optic nerve disease with arcuate defects. And then mid-peripheral is usually seen with uh, non-advanced retinitis pigmentosa or a fake it correction where you get the jack-in-the-box phenomenon that we often talk about. Um, and that usually is between kind of 30 and 60 degrees, which um, not often, um, if it's early enough, not picked up on a Humphrey uh, test because of the amount of testing that we do, but sometimes is. So um, this Sorry, is a acute macular um, Yeah, it's a, it's a specific condition that we don't fully understand yet, and basically it's just uh, like what we think is an inflammatory or possibly even vascular condition where you have acute paracentral visual field deficits. Sometimes um, you get central visual field deficits, but then the central vision comes back and you get this paracentral defects that stay. Um, it, is, it is an entity um, that is relatively new, um, but it has been um, described in the literature uh, before. Now, one thing I did want to mention, you know, we did see the um, uh, geographic atrophy in the previous case that I showed you. Um, all the rest of the things I think are a little self-explanatory, but um, this is an, an interesting timbit. Um, there's a kind of a, a not so new entity, but people talk about something called coffee and donut maculopathy. So, um, you know, there's cases been reported of, of patients who drink like 20 cups of coffee a day, so be careful and don't do that. But the thought behind that is um, when um, we have adenosine in our vasculature that uh, basically vasodilate um, retinal vasculature, and coffee is thought to be an inhibitor of that, and so it causes vasoconstriction. So uh, presumably uh, when you, I guess, drink a lot of coffee and continuously vasoconstrict your uh, paramacula fiber, uh, paramacula vessels, you have um, uh, impairment of the macula blood flow and that in turn causes um, paramacula deficits or visual field deficits. So it's kind of a, an interesting thing that's kind of relevant um, to us. But um, fovea is good because it's still getting the, the uh, uh, perfusion from the choroid because it's so thin, um, but you get these paracentral or central uh, ring scotomas. Okay, so important to keep in mind. So this particular patient um, had uh, these peripheral retinal pathology that you can see here, and um, um, she had retinitis pigmentosa. Okay, so this is the next case, 64-year-old man with blurry vision in the left eye. I think this has to be an easy one, just to be quick. Okay, what uh, does this look like? Uh, so this is a 24-2 and a uh, inferior um, hemi defect in the left eye. So altitudinal visual altitudinal field deficit. Yes, mm -hmm. So uh, since this is neuropthalmology, um, what do you think this is classically associated? Yeah. So this uh, patient um, did have 
uh, NAION and um, why uh, does this why does this make sense with the CT? So the one question I do want to ask you, though, is how long do you think it's been since he acutely developed an AION? A while. Right. Over, over four <laughs> how weeks. How much is it like? Huh? Over four weeks. Yeah, so I, I think usually kind of six weeks, six to eight weeks is when you think about atrophy setting in um, to the optic nerve. So um, it's important to kind of realize that if there's no edema, that it's probably been an extended period of time. Now. If, again, I, I think we've kind of discussed this point before, but if I just see atrophy like this and nobody's told me that he's had swelling, what would I be concerned about? Yes. Yes, so compressive optic neuropathy. So again, think about it. If you do not see swelling in an NIO, classic NAION NAI presentation, you have to rule out compressive optic neuropathy. So if this person came in swollen, you would scan him? Well, if, if it's a classic, you know, presentation, yeah, and he's got the risk factor, exactly. <laughs> yes, then um, probably not. Okay. But if uh, he did not, and it was not a classic presentation, yes. Okay, 35-year-old woman with this visual field deficit. or something like that, or atrophy, um, or parapapular atrophy just in myopic tilted nerves that you can get enlargement of blind spot. And um, one other entity that's uh, really good to think about because you actually don't see much on examination, and often um, it's missed because unless you do specialized testing, um, you will not pick this up. Um, so acute idiopathic blind spot enlargement or variation of the mute syndrome is important to keep in mind, especially when you have a unilateral um, isolated temporal deficit. That's an important thing to rule out so it doesn't send you down the garden path looking at brain lesions. Okay, so this lady had um, uh, edema. Yes. All right, so this is the next case. Um, and uh, again, this should be kind of your garden variety of things that um, we, we need to think about. And like I mentioned to you before, because of our inconsistencies in field testing and uh, lack of uh, exact precision, um, we look at the flavor of the visual field. So this lady came in um, because she went to see an optometrist to get bifocals, um, he did a screening visual field, and he noticed uh, this visual field deficit. So you guys can just generally yell out what you think this is. Yeah, so this is a bitemporal visual field deficit, and um, you know, yes, there's a few lesions here, but again, the flavor is, is that it does respect the, the vertical midline, so you really have to think back, right? So you have um, uh, which portion of the superior versus inferior visual field is located? Um, is it inferior or superior? The visual field. So that would correspond to? <laughs> Correct. So what is the most common lesion in the pituitary? Pituitary, pituitary adenoma, right? So macro, micro, whatever. But that's the most common. So this is naturally how it works. It expands and it pushes on the chiasm. It comes 
suppresses inferior chiasm and causes your superior visual field deficits. All right, so this is, this is her um, MR, which uh, showed, of course, chiasm compression from below. I don't know if you can like even see a little bit of it there, and um, she was operated on. All right, next case is a 41-year-old woman with a three-month history of decreased visual acuity in her left eye. She was sent by an optometrist um, because he thought she had a CSR, and uh, uh, she was sent to us to treat it. And uh, I, uh, this is where I profess my love for AMSLA grids, because I really do like them. And um, I, I want to kind of briefly mention the fact that um, you should really differentiate an AMSLA grid whether you have like a field deficit or metamorphopsia. So, um, you know, with things like CSR, you actually get metamorphopsia because there's some movement of the, uh, of the retina kind of side or forward and, and there's distortion. So you always get metamorphopsia type field deficits, whereas with a field deficit or absence of RP photoreceptors, ganglion cells or whatever else, or damage to them, you actually will have a deficit um, or a blurry spot or a visual field deficit. So it's really kind of important for you um, to ask the patients what exactly they're seeing, if it's a metamor metamorphopsia or a visual field deficit. And um, we had a look at the back of her eye, and we're like, oh, what's What? I guess pretty good macula. Let's, at that time, with like 2013, we did a serious OCT. So um, she, uh, of note, is the fact that she had a visual acuity on the right of 2020 and on the left of 20 over 100. Okay? But normal visual fields. Oh, sorry, normal, um, opt uh, no normal macular exam. So we did a Goldman visual field. And so if you look at this visual field, um, I really, again, want you to think about that flavor, okay? So like what is the general area these scotomas are in? They're temporal, exactly. So where is my mind going? Exactly. And the reason why, you know, it's, you know, okay, fine, say maybe that's an enlarged blind spot, but it's not really going around, like it's going straight to the vertical, um, to the vertical midline there, and the same thing there. Now, this is, again, to speak to the imprecision of our visual field testing. She has, even though you don't quite see the involvement of the center with this particular Goldman, you know that the center is involved because why? She's 2100. She's 2100, right? So she has a central visual field deficit on the left. Very good, okay, so really important. It doesn't look like your classic, your, you know, if you're a wedge defect or, you know, um, kind of your junctional scotoma, but this is, this is your junctional scotoma, which is maybe a little bit harder to pick out. And um, you're not always gonna see kind of where it's described nicely and drawn in with the wedge defect, but this is your junctional scotoma. So uh, this patient had a large intercellular mass that um, was about two and a half by about three and a half um, centimeters. Um, it was elevating the optic chiasm, clearly compressing one of the um, anterior optic nerves. And the, the concept that we always talk about in junctional scotoma is, is what? It's a bit of a theoretical thing and anatomically not um, supported, but um, what is the name of, very good. So von, von, Von Wilbrand's knee is something we talk about theoretically to um, convince ourselves that um, this junctional field de uh, deficit makes sense. So this patient actually had pituitary apoplexy because she had some methemoglobin in the um, in the lesion, and so she was operated on. So is that just kind of you can see that just like irregularly on the yeah. <clears throat> Just a quick question, just to remind me, this is so big anatomically, this is a left junctional, left junctional defect, correct? So or she's, com exactly, she's left. compressing her left optic nerve. Right, okay. Right, um, and so, um, yeah, you just have to always think about a chiasm with the junctional. Okay, um, so this is a case, one case before we do the quiz, all right? Um, this kind of incorporates a few little things that Dr. Warner talked about. Um, and uh, kind of helps us um, get more conceptual uh, conceptualization of the anterior visual pathway. So it's a 49-year-old man who presented with a headache and um, ptosis on the left and uh, double vision. 
And as you remember, I talk about the three musketeers of extraocular motility, so you always need to talk about the pupil. Um, he had some light near dissociation of the pupil um, on his um, left side, and um, he doesn't typically get headaches. And uh, this is what um, we see. So again, what is, uh, so, so take this one step at a time. What is the flavor of this visual field deficit? Or uh, kind of where's the biggest abnormality in this visual field? Right Very good. So right homonymous, right? Right homonymous, and if you forget about this, it's right homonymous, and I need a few more qualifiers there. Or one, at least one qualifier. Right? Reverse. Sorry? So um, we talk about complete and incomplete homonymous visual field deficits. <coughs> if you, you know, forget about this, because we'll talk about this in a second, but this here is a complete homonymous visual field deficit. Where is the lesion with complete homonymous visual field deficits? We have tracks. More posterior. More so actually, you cannot say, there's nothing in that visual field that qualifies for a location, okay? Once you have a homonymous visual field deficit that is complete, it is retrochiasmal, you have no idea where it is, okay? So you just, you, you, there's just no way to tell. So it's either imaging or some other auxiliary testing we can talk about later that can help you distinguish where exactly it is. But there's some help here, okay? So if you look at, um, uh, let, let's talk about this here. So this visual field deficit, which is an inferior temporal on the left, right? What, on the left, correct? Um, which, um, what, what could this be? What, what pattern could this be associated with? So if you look at this, and you look at that, what could be hiding behind this homonymous field? A bitemporal, very good. And then, um, but also if you just were to isolate the left eye and just look at that, what would this give you an idea of? Correct. So you have options here because you either have, so you have a homonymous visual field deficit, this is complete, so you think it's retrochiasmal somewhere. You think maybe that could be bitemporal, so that locates you into the into the chiasm, right? Or you can have this altitudinal visual field deficit which points you to the, to the nerve, right? And if I gave you some, some clues here, so um, there was a relative afferent pupillary defect on the left, and this pattern of the OCT, and you're gonna probably wear it to the Saturday Christmas party. Very good. <laughs> All right, so you are really worried about this. Is, is, are you thinking more occipital lobe here? Are you thinking more anterior here? More anterior. Exactly. Yeah. So um, I just wanted to go over this so we can put this together. And the, the problem here, as Dr. Warner had mentioned about an APD on the, um, the opposite eye, um, here, unfortunately, because you have this optic neuropathy with global atrophy here now, um, it, it's, it, it doesn't quite meet. The, the opposite eye or uh, RAPD criteria. It's subsumed into the optic world. Yeah. All right, so this uh, gentleman had this large pituitary uh, macro that was like invading um, all, all tissues around and involving the, um, <coughs> the tracts as well, uh, which is why you get the bow tie atrophy and why you get a homonymous field deficit. All right, here's a quiz. And then there's a few cases after if we have time, but uh, we'll do this first.
progressively harder. <laughs> My goodness. <laughs> essay points, essay questions. <laughs> <laughs> lecture, right? If you did the reading, you should know the stuff. When they, when they cut down on our lecture schedules, we pumped up the reading. <laughs> and plus we brought Anna on board. Uh, it's just like that environment. That's the key difference. This is what I was discussing with Dr. Warner yesterday. I was like, well, I can use a quiz to just reiterate which we just learned, or we can Use the quiz to learn some more. <laughs> we'll do half and half. No, it's I decided to compromise. So. All right, good. All right, as far as we're gonna get. <laughs> um, so, what's the answer to this question? Very good, D. So, why wouldn't it be a full field? It'll be normal in both, right? No differentiation there whatsoever. Why is not why is it not a VEP? It looks at a nerve, but would it be what would we do with maculopathy or optic neuropathy? It will the VEP is actually very driven by the foveal response. So you're actually gonna you can get to reduce to VEPs with optic neuropathy and maculopathy. So that's not the test to use. Again, these are the things we think about when we order testing, right? Why is it not EOG? What do you test? That's disease. Very good. And uh, of course, multifocal ERG will tell you that there's abnormalities when there's amplitudes. Very good. Okay, what about this one? Sorry? B. B, very good. So it is actually more common in children than it is in adults. Um, you have supercellular mass, which it is probably one of the more common causes of c nystagmus, even though c nystagmus is very rare. Um, and it does have a favorable survival prognosis of about 90% to 10 years or so. Um, but um, we, we talked about this, right? So inferior versus superior visual field deficits and which part of the chiasm is being compressed. You just need to understand the anatomy of the chiasmal fibers to answer that question. Um, do you need the list of the ring scotomas to help you, or do you guys? Here? I think you know this was just pretty much from that list, so I think you can uh, you can mark that as, as you wish. Um, so, does anybody know what Erdogan phenomenon is? And uh, Kristen? <laughs> it's neurological. That's why I can't point to that. <laughs> um, so. Don't you know that, don't you? So yeah, radon phenomenon is actually um, uh, this visual field phenomenon where if a patient has an injury to generally the occipital uh, lobes uh, or occipital cortex, um, sometimes it can be seen with other uh, lesions as well, but they perceive moving targets but not static objects, okay? So if there's a car parked there, they do not see it, but as the car moves, they begin to see it, and we think it is because the, uh, the, there's kind of more predilection of visual system to respond to better, to moving stimuli rather than stationary stimuli. And the last uh, two questions I think are really important to know about because hemifield um, slide phenomenon um, is a, re a relevant phenomenon clinically because we see patients with bitemporal 
um, you know, deficits. And so um, basically what this is, is that you can see if the patient has any predilection, um, so this is double vision without any paresis of extraocular muscles, and any predilection of a patient with visual field deficit um, where uh, you have a phoria, so either a vertical, uh, an exo, or an esophoria, all of a sudden, because you don't have overlapping visual fields, you're losing that fixation. So you know how we break fusion when we do our tropian fourier testing? You're pretty much doing that with eliminating their visual fields, right? So eliminating their hemifield. And so once fusion is disrupted, the existing fourier just has no, um, oops, uh, the existing fourier just has uh, kind of no check on it because of that fusional drive for it to keep the eyes together. So once the fusion is disrupted, the pre-existing fourier comes out and becomes a tropia. And so patients will either have a crossed or uncrossed diplopia, depending on what their tendency was uh, prior to having their hemifield visual field deficits. It's a well-described phenomenon. Um, it is um, sometimes asked about on boards, and this is why I, uh, I put that up there. And then the other important thing about um, bitemporal um, deficits is this, uh, this phenomenon of post-fixation blindness. And uh, what that deals with is the fact that, of course, your temporal visual field um, is affected. And so and when you're fixating on a near target, so when you have a near target, again, this is your fovea and this is your center, so you're not, you're missing, your visual field does not allow you to see anything that's post-fixation. So uh, pa patients are not aware of it, but they're actually going to be missing. So fixating a near target, they're missing everything that's located in that area because of that overlap. Okay. So again, it's a related to fixation. When you're fixating at a near target, when you're looking far away, that's not an issue, right? Because you're not overlapping. But here, because you are, you've got this post-fixation blindness phenomenon. As Anna says, almost never described by patients, but we actually had a guy at the VA who that was his presenting complaint because he was a truck driver mm -hmm. and he observed in the long hours that when he was looking at the car right ahead of him, he couldn't see the cars beyond, which incredibly rare observation. I mean, I, I, I've never ever heard anybody mention it ever before or since. Except for a truck driver. Except for this truck driver. And so it, it what, I mean, that's not really a near target, but the same principle applies. It's not at infinity. So anywhere closer than infinity, this will, of course, apply post fixation, right? Pretty, okay, pretty so. Pretty good observation. All right, so <laughs> I'm going to stop here. <laughs> <laughs> what did he have? Did he have a he had a two or three two. Oh, I want that. <laughs> the third eye you want? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the third eye refractor? <laughs> okay, guys, I hear.